happy to have Professor Dimitri Saltis here. Um, Professor Saltis uh, was educated at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University, and he received his uh, PhD degree in electrical engineering. After graduation, she, uh, uh, he joined the uh, faculty at Caltech. When he was at Caltech, he was the director of NSF Research Centers and also Center for Auto Fluidics uh, Integration. In 2007, uh, Professor Saltis moved to EPFL in Switzerland and in Lausanne, the Echo Polytechnic Federal de Lausanne, where he is a director and a professor of uh, optics laboratory and also the dean of school of engineering. Um, I had a great time working with uh, Professor Saltis during my PhD, working on novel imaging systems uh, in biological uh, environments. Today he will tell us his recent achievement of uh, imaging with multi-mode fibers. Please join me to welcome the speaker. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my, I count it as my fifth time in Taiwan, and uh, hope, uh, hope I'll come several more times. Uh, before going to, uh, to Lausanne, to EPFL, I was at Caltech, and there, very lucky there to have many of people from uh, in Taiwan, particularly this University of Life. So I think I counted uh, at least five students from Taiwan that I've had uh, advised this PhD student. And uh, now I'm at EPFL, so I'm still take students. So if you're interested in uh, what you see here or what I do, definitely uh, 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 consider applying to us as well. I know this is a physics colloquium, and most of you are physics students. Uh, what I'll talk about is not physics, it's applied physics or engineering, but more applied physics. Uh, so it's, uh, it's in the general area of optics, and uh, Chalung, who's now uh, here, and Professor Ken Shu, who's in Chao from the CU, I'll talk about the contributions at the end as well, uh, but this is the outline of my talk. I'll talk mostly about this technique called digital phase conjugation, which is an old, an old technique, a holographic method for undoing distortion or light propagates through aberrating media or distorting media or scattering media. The primary topic of my talk is, is this, that to make uh, endoscopes with give new properties, or unique properties for examining things inside the body or in places where it's difficult to, to even do it. Uh, so the, the thing we do specifically is using multi-mode fibers, and I'll explain what that is, uh, to make these endoscopes. And I'll describe different techniques for how we do it. And in the end, as time permits, I'll take one application, which is imaging the cochlea, the part inside the ear that uh, has the, uh, the light, the uh, sound sensitive uh, uh, cells. And I'll talk about the application of this endoscope. Uh, so, this is a picture of my hometown. Maybe uh, uh, my colleague will recognize it. It's the uh, it's a tower that's a symbol of this. White Tower, and on a clear day with a normal camera lens, you can see it. Or if you use your eye, you would see the same thing. And uh, you know this the physics, if you will, that describes how light is scattered from the tower itself. And this is your eye, and then it's mapped onto the retina. It's well described by Maxwell's equations of free space. You see the wave equation, and this is a linear equation, uh, which means uh, some linear transformation from the reflectivity of this tower all the way to your eye, and then this is well known. And this transformation is turns out to so well suited that a single lens can undo it. In other words, as I go from this tower to your eye, the light gets distorted, but then but then when uh, if I apply the lens, it undoes all this distortion and I get a clear image. On a foggy day like this, you cannot see it very well, and neither the lens that took this, uh, let me find out this. So the lens in your eye, if you were to see it, or the lens in, uh, in the camera could not see very well. And the lens is, is not in a, 
course, it's not a, an accident that the lens is such an important element in optics, because it's exactly that. The lens undoes the diffraction uh, from free space, and it evolved in eyes of humans and most, a lot of animals, and, uh, and of course, we use it all the time for imaging. But only if we're talking about free space. If instead we have some inhomogeneity, which normally you would express it as the index of refraction variation in the medium in between, that scatters light, distorts light, and when I attempt to use the lens, not thinking, not thinking about it, I just attempt to use the lens thinking that it would also work, it doesn't work and I don't see it. But in reality, the lens is not good. So the question is, is there another device other than the lens that I could use instead and st still see through the fog? So the answer is yes, there is. But you know, it's difficult to know. You have to measure the properties of the fog first, and this could be changing in kind as well. But there is. So a lot of this recent activity in fog, waveform shaping or adaptive optics and so forth, is based on this idea to try to find uh, uh, ways to invert this unknown transformation, something that the lens does very simply for, for free space, homogeneous media. But for you have something like this. We have to figure it out. Now, for a long time, 1953 was the first publication, as far as I know, people in astronomy have been thinking about this. Because in astronomy, you have the same problem. You have a distant star, and then you like to image that. And, but if you do it on Earth, you have to go through the atmosphere, and the atmosphere does some distortion. A little bit similar to the fog I showed you, but not quite so bad. And then, basically, instead of having a nice plane wave due to the radiation from a long uh, distance away, that a, a nice plane wave would focus to a tight spot here. Uh, instead, this lens that you're trying to image with doesn't recognize this distortion and produces a blurred spot. It would be something like an economic blurred spot. So what they do in astronomy, they use a simple interferometer, uh, which here, which measures the phase, measures this wavefront. Then you feed that back and you have a mirror, it's called a rubber mirror, which deforms to compensate for this wavefront and flatten it out. So now you have this flat uh, wavefront that's coming in here, and now it focuses to a sharp. So you can have this, uh, well, can be dramatic improvement, depending on the weather conditions and everything else, to correct for this distortion that's due to the propagation through the atmosphere, with this index variation. Uh, again, this is a very well, that's, that technique has also been applied to microscopy. So you have microscopes that have an adaptive uh, element that compensates for distortions that have to do with uh, entering into the sample and things like that. Now, the more recent activity is more, more strong distortions, scattering. So this is a picture of uh, one of my students, actually, in front of the light. As you can see, the light goes through tissue. So when you look at your hand, it doesn't look like uh, it's transparent. But in fact, if you, if, you, if, I, if you did this and there was no light here, I, you would see some of the light coming through. So the light can enter tissue. Normally, it enters without scattering, any photos scattering from any of the uh, tissue. So maybe 100 microns, 200 microns, depending on the tissue. And it will penetrate a few millimeters inside tissue. Uh, so the question is, can we do that? Can we see a few millimeters or maybe uh, up to possibly a centimeter inside tissue by correcting this distortion? Is that possible? Uh, so in other words, when the light comes through here, somehow it has scattered off of whatever was in there. So maybe it contains the information to read it out. So like I said, in the last, I would say, five, six years, there's been a flurry of activity. A lot of people all over the world working on this problem and uh, wh whether this is possible. Now, why exactly this flurry? You know, sometimes it happens, right? It's like this. Some notion of interest to start with it. But in reality, this is, goes back a long time. I would say uh, from 1970, around there, where people were discussing about the technique called phase conjugation. So the idea is this. If you have a scattering video, which we can think of uh, a medium consisting of small little dielectric spheres that normally would scatter light. So if you had just one of them, they would scatter light. But if you have many of them, they get scattered off of each other and so forth. So if you have a ray of light, which means a stream of photons coming here, some of the photons may be reflected there, 
and we reflect it again, etc. And then after all these reflections, like billiard balls uh, bouncing around, a nice plane wave that was coming here would look like a mess here, it would look like a speckle pattern on the other side. And we would have some description of this film, let's say so far, it would be a complex field. It would have at least point some amplitude, which means some measure of how many photons are crossing that area, and some phase, which means what is the, the phase of the oscillation in that point. So it should, turns out that if you simply reverse the phase, if you conjugate this quantity, that's why it's called phase computation. If you take the phase, if it was 30 degrees, you make it minus 30 degrees, and, it's, and uh, another point was 53 degrees, minus 53 degrees. You change that phase, and you launch the wave backwards, then everything gets undone. The, uh, all the scattering gets undone the wrong way, the, the right way, and then the, the nice plane wave that was constructed, that was illuminating, is reconstructed. <coughs> so this sounds like a way to, you might use this property to, uh, to reconstruct, to see something behind it. So this is a scattering medium, this is tissue. If there's something to see here, then, uh, then uh, the fact that we can undo this damage with scattering medium uh, would be, uh, would be uh, this phase conjugation would be a way to pursue. The problem, there is, even though this idea has been around for a long, long time, uh, it hasn't really provided the solution to this problem of imaging behind scattering medium because this phase conjugation needs to be done behind the scattering medium. So if I want to see inside my hand, I have to illuminate my hand, go inside my hand, change the phase, conjugate it, and then have the light come back out. So that's the problem. How am I gonna put something inside my hand to conjugate? So a lot of the recent activity has to do with this, trying to solve this problem. And Shalom uh, says this is also open. Now, one of the advances that made the big uh, difference is this, uh, this uh, uh, development of phase conjugation done digitally. I'll show you what that's done. Normally, to implement this phase conjugation, you use hologram. You take the light that comes through the scattering medium, the speckle pattern, you make a hologram of it, and then it turns out from holography, if you read it out the other way, uh, you make the reference beam, the reference beam was coming from this direction, and you interfere this pattern and this pattern in this medium, if you reconstruct it, the hologram this way, then you get the reconstruction coming back towards the left, and the phase of the waveform is exactly like you want in phase conjugation. Because if you remember, I don't know if you took a holography course, the interference pattern is the product of S times R star, and also R star times S star phase conjugation. So automatically, if you conjugate the reference beam, you get, you get the right. So if you do an experiment that we Part of the reason we started this was an experiment with biological tissue and showed that holography can reconstruct this in a not too long ago, about five, six years ago, we published this paper. Now, the significant technological development is instead of doing this phase conjugation with crystals or holographic medium or photographic film, we can do it digitally, meaning take a CCD camera or a simple sensor and take the result and digitize it in the computer, and take the result of the digitized uh, signal and use it to drive what's called a spatial light modulator. The spatial light modulator is a device similar to the one that's on this projector, very similar, probably a liquid crystal device, it could be a man's device. It's an array of light modulators. Usually this now, these days, can have one million pixels, maybe two million pixels, and of course cameras can have uh, even more, more than so the development of technology to have cameras that can sense the light with a reference beam record a hologram, then digitize that, go in the computer and do any manipulation that you want. This becomes a key part. In the computer you can, you can do supplementary computation. And then take that and represent it as a computer-generated hologram on a special light modulator, made this phase conjugation technique much more, much more easier to do. Now, the other element that became, uh, so that's one thing, uh, being able to do things with, uh, uh, instead of crystals and physical devices, being able to do it with spatial light modulators and, and detectors and computers. 
The other thing is this idea that you have to somehow have something on the other side, inside, a beacon of light, some signal from inside that you can use to, uh, to guide you for how to shape the weather. So many of these techniques, including the ones I will show you, use in some way a beacon of light. Uh, Shalom gave his thesis on something we call strength. Maybe another day he will tell you what strengths are about. It's the uh, second harmonic particles that can insert into a city. But the, the basic idea is this. You have a lens, so this big part here is an objective lens, and you illuminate it with a plane wave. You'll get a converging spherical wave on the other side. You have a scattering medium here. You get this distortion. Now, if you had on the other side a beacon, some way to generate light that will go backwards, this light would generate this, uh, this speckle pattern back on the side where you want to be. Because if this is the skin, and this is something inside the body, now I'm back outside the skin, I can measure this. And then, uh, and then now you can do the space conjugation, you focus on this. So this idea, I said this is new, and it's been driving, but uh, Joe Goodman, the famous Joe Goodman, if you will, famous because of Fourier optics book, uh, he's famous for many things. Actually. But uh, back then, in 1960, he had a very similar idea. He said, what you need to do to do this uh, away from reconstruction, this was the, it's the time that Lid and all these people were talking about the space communication. He brought the idea. But this was never really followed up until I would say the first time somebody explicitly talked about it was this fellow, Allard Moskin, or talked about, about uh, this idea of the, of the uh, beacon inside. And then came Shalom Sheh, which I think really did the first experiment, uh, which I'll show you now, to allow you to image behind the scattering media. Uh, Shalom started with me at Caltech, but then we both moved to, to Lausanne together. So this is the phase pattern on a liquid crystal SLM, very similar to something up there, uh, that uh, he calculated or he recorded and then calculated to put on the input SLF, so that when you put it back through a scattering medium, uh, it will focus. So this experimental result is very much like doing this, except here he had one of these specialized modulator on, on which the phase contact wave from S was put, and then you get this focus. So at that time, he could do only 400 times, 400 times stronger than the background. Nowadays, I think we could do several times but even the first experiment could show that the spot size, spot size was diffraction limited. In other words, the spot was as small as you would get with the lens if there was no scattering medium in it. If you put the wrong thing here, you put nothing, or if you put the zone plate, or some, something like a lens to focus, what you get here is a little noise-like pattern in spectrum. But you put the right thing and you get this focus. So that's like magic. That's, uh, that's great. That's that phase conjugation. Now what, uh, what you can also show is that if you, what you can also uh, do is if you take this light and focus it, and you bend the incident beam, tilt it, then this spot moves. So this is the original focus spot, and then if you tilt the input beam, then the focusing moves, so you can scan it behind the object. And being able to scan it, you know, a uh, beam behind the scattering thing, Big because it says I can go into my hand here with this, and by changing the angle of this pointer, I can have a focus beam of light inside that scans something. So, for example, if I want to do fluorescence, if I have something that's fluorescing, I can read it out, I can illuminate it, and read the fluorescence out, which is what we're doing here. So, uh, again, everything's been done uh, a long time ago. It seems. This, this was called a long time ago by again the very bright people the memory effect of scattering media uh, because the idea is that the this, uh, the system has some memories because it allows you to shift it if it, this was completely random the scattering was completely random then any perturbation of the incident field would make this focusing go away as you can see for 185 microns here this spot. So what Shalom did then, I guess this was the core of his thesis, the major result of his thesis, I would say, yes. Uh, he, he showed, I think for the first time, I can claim for the first time, uh, 
that to image an object which was a screen of EPFL, we are saying EPFL, a core polytechnic with an algorithm, uh, behind the scatter, which normally you could see, so you could see anything, but if you try to focus this beam through, using a beacon called the strength, you're able to focus that, and then using this memory of actually scan to the and got the image out. And without uh, uh, and attempting to do this, attempting to simply focus with, balli with ballistic photons through the scatter, ballistic photons are photons that go through a scatter without hitting it. So without being scattered over so ballistic. But, uh, but in a scatter like this, uh, normally like this, uh, then you get nothing. So, so this was an idea for how to image behind the scatter using a beacon that tells you how to generate the phase conflict wave and then generating the phase conflict wave. So this at the time was a, you know, well, with a lot of citations, Shalom is here now, I know, so it was a good thing for us. But it was only the beginning. So many different things have happened, but the, what I'll focus on for the rest of the talk is application of this idea to, to endoscopy, mode mode five. Now, endoscopes is, uh, means being able to see inside. Uh, Greek, you might know what it means, means being able to see something so it's another way to go around the scattering problem of the tissue. Because if you can put it through openings that exist or penetrate the tissue and put the, the device inside, then you have an endoscope. And you cannot put easily big lenses inside your body. So you want to have long, narrow things like needles to insert. And those are endoscopes usually made with fiber. So the typical endoscope may be like this, where you have a single mode fiber in which you couple light. So this would be a fluorescence uh, microscopy example. This light diverges and then the lens focuses again. And then typically there's a MEMS mirror that scans the light, so this is the object. So in all of this, on the left is the object inside the body. On the right is the measurement thing inside, so the skin or tissue. You so you scan this, every time you hit a spot, fluorescence is generated. And the fluorescence is normally coupled into the cladding of the, of the same fiber and then measured back here. So by scanning uh, the beam, you generate the fluorescent fields. The most commonly used uh, endoscope is uh, what's called the multi-core fiber. So this is an array of multi-mode fibers which are then uh, uh, stacked or made in an array so that each one of those is a separate pixel. So the idea is then that you bring it close enough to the object and then, or with a lens, you image the, the object onto the then, then each pixel gets transmitted separately, and then that can be measured separately from the band. <laughs> that's, that's the real problem with work with batteries, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so, uh, that's the most common, it's is very, very simple. Uh, it's coherent, it works with coherent or incoherent light, this doesn't have any active part. The variation of this, which is a green lens, green stands for graded index. It's like a lens, like a long, thin lens. Uh, that's more specialty. And the one I will talk about is this multi-mode fiber, uh, which is uh, more or less an alternative to this. The major advantage of this compared to this is that this has maybe uh, the resolution of this and the number of pixels is limited by the number of cores you can put together, maybe a few thousand. Whereas this can have uh, hundreds of thousands or millions, depending on the number of modes you can support. So, in case you're not familiar with this, a single mode fiber supports a wave that's a Gaussian light beam. So, if you put this, if you match the input illumination to the multi mode, to the single mode fiber, to the mode that it likes to see, which is again something like a Gaussian, Gaussian within the core dying off exponentially the cladding the surrounding area. As long as the middle has an index higher than the surrounding, then the smoke gets guided. And on the other hand, side you get this nice Gaussian-like thing. So in communications, we use this always because it's nice to have a single mode that you know how it behaves, you launch it, then maybe it disperses in time and so forth, but information can be transmitted at very high rates because of the high bandwidth. Now, a multi-mode fiber generally has a much bigger diameter core, so it can support many, many different modes. 
So maybe something like this is single Gaussian, but modes with uh, the double peak or many, many different modes. Typically, for a, for a uh, fiber of diameter, let's say for 100 microns, maybe 100,000 nodes. So the output of this is like a, similar to a uh, scattering medium. It's a random-like pattern, like a, like a spectrum. So for communication, this is terrible because if you're trying to modulate this in time or, or space, uh, if you, if you try to put information on this beam so that it can be extracted from here, all this mode scrambling makes it very difficult now to go back and see what the, get the information out of there. So multi-mode fibers are not commonly used in communications because of this. It's starting to be used again, but that's another different story. But if you're talking about imaging, image transmission, well, that's a, a good thing because you have a lot of room to send multiple pixels, multiple channels of information. So even though they're scrambled, if you can find a way to use how each mode can transmit a different pixel, then maybe you can do it. Now, like most of what I've been talking about today, uh, the, uh, this, also the story of imaging for multi-mode fibers is not, is, has a, an old progenitor, an old grandfather. And he's also a fan, another famous guy, I don't know if you guys know him, that's Amram Yarid. Uh, because you know him. Uh, where a long time ago, in 76, he wrote this paper about how you transmit uh, information through multi-mode fibers. <coughs> And it was not replicated till uh, many years later, 20 years, but not replicated. This was a proposal, and this was uh, implemented by a Japanese group in 20 years later. And then this is all very recent, including uh, our own group. So one of the reasons is, again, this digital holography, because what the Japanese people did uh, was use holography. Now this is what Yarif proposed, how to do it. Uh, so now that you know about phase conjugation, maybe it'll be easy to understand. So if you have an image here, and you're trying to launch it through this multi-mode optical fiber, as you put it here, it gets scrambled, and it makes a uh, speckle pattern in the middle. So what Yarif suggested was to make a hologram here, generate the phase conjugated version of the hologram, and then launch it through an identical piece of fiber, the same piece of fiber. And then on the other side, it should be undone. And the image that was here would be mapped to a speckle pattern here, a random pattern. But if you face conjugate that and launch it to an identical piece of fiber, and that was kind of the flow of the technique, you get the image from the visual fiber. So the Japanese fellows did it in this crystal called barium catenate. Uh, and they were able to show that if you take this input image and go through the fiber, uh, you, uh, you can get this reconstruction separate fiber, these are different lengths of fiber. So exactly through the same fiber you get a, a, a nice quality, through a different fiber you still get a reconstruction. So they're not very convincing results, but, but at least the proof of the principle. And again, this they have to do with the crystal, the very careful to see to the exposure, to read it out and so forth. So it was a fantastic experiment, but not, but not uh, now with these new techniques, with these new ideas of using digital uh, <coughs> digital phase conjugation, which is something, again, we, we started this back at Caltech, but we use it quite a bit now, uh, also in France. If you take a spot on the fiber and box it here, that spot of light will diffract and be coupled to, to many, many modes to give you the spectral pattern. Now we can make a hologram of this on the CMOS sensor, so the reference comes here, the signal comes here. This interference pattern is recorded. From that, we extract the phase on the computer. Then that phase is recorded, just like Shalom did before, on the, uh, on the SLM. And now, when that's launched back into the by reflection, if we launch it back to the fiber, all the stuff gets undone, and we get a focus spot on the far end. So once again, the key is to focus light on the other side. So. You can think of this as a learning phase. So you have a piece of fiber that is very random otherwise, but once you learn by recording its uh, fraction pattern or its, uh, its speckle pattern, and store this in the computer, now you can use it to focus light on the other. 